The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Micah, chapter 7, verses 1 through 20. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie, lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil, to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. A day for the building of your walls. In that day the boundary shall be far extended. In that day, that day they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt and from Egypt to the river, referring to the river Euphrates, from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. But the earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants for the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, who dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt. I will show them marvelous things. The nation shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of at their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old.
As you've probably already gathered, our subject of this morning's sermon is the book of Micah. Of course, who, as we've just heard, excels in exploring both the, the plums of human, of plumbing the depth of human wickedness. You know, one cannot even trust her who lies in one's bosom. Of course, and the heights of God's mercy will throw our sins behind them as if into the sea, behind him as if into the sea. Now, we learn, we know very little about Micah himself. What we do know of him comes from Micah 1, chapter 1. I apologize, that was a dumb thing to say. Chapter 1, verse 1. All right, so be it. Micah 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Of course, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Remember the divided kingdom, for to them usually is Israel and Judah. Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem, the capital of the southern Right now, Josem ascended the throne as Israel's ruler when his father Uzziah was stricken with leprosy. Right, and so, some of you will remember why Uzziah was stricken with leprosy. All right, so he is Jotham, Jotham ascended the throne around 748 BC. Right now, Hezekiah began his reign in 716 B.C. Excuse me, and then Jotham died in 732 B.C. So we know they said he, the book says he prophesied under Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So he couldn't have started earlier than 748, but he couldn't have started later than 732. Now Hezekiah was the last in that list. Hezekiah began in his reign, began his reign in 716. Right, so, and he died in 687. So, and I think we should place Micah's prophecy, at least significant parts of it, um, near the, anyway, near the end of the reign of Hezekiah. You know, because of particular things he refers to as having already occurred. All right. But again, you know, in Micah, the, the focus is not on Micah, the, past, the prophet. Of course, the focus is on God, who is about to judge the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And this is essentially an anthology of sermons proclaiming these judgments. In Micah, we have two central themes. The first is that of the destruction of the wicked kingdoms. Now again, you all know about how the kingdom of Israel was divided after Solomon's death into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom usually referred to as Judah, the northern as Israel. Now, so he prophesies the destruction of Israel, or the northern kingdom, in Micah chapter 1, verses 2 through 7, right at the outset. It says, Hear, you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will melt under him. And the valleys will split open like wax before the fire. Like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob. And for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it, not in, is it not Samaria, 
This, of course, would be the capital, the center of the idolatry sponsored by the monarchs of the northern kingdom. And what is the high place of Judah? There's you're not allowed to sacrifice vice at high places either. All right, is it not Jerusalem? That is the capital, the focus of the wickedness. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards, and I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. So cutting it off right down to the foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire. And all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them. And to the fee of a prostitute they will return. So we have quite a grim, stern message against the northern kingdom. Right, Micah has similar things to say about the southern kingdom. Judah, as we read in Micah chapter 4, verses 9 through 10a. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished that pain seized you like a woman in labor? Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. Yes, he's predicting the Babylonian exile there. And, and Micah explores in some detail. He doesn't just announce the judgment that God is bringing. He also reproves the people of both kingdoms for their sins. Right, by which they brought down on themselves the divine judgment. Right, and the principal sins in the case of both kingdoms are two. The first of those is irreverence towards God. Yes, and Micah speaks of this in Micah chapter 5, verses 10 through 15, where we read, and in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. Of course, tellers of fortunes, of course, they're appealing to supernatural powers other than God, that's a form of idolatry. And I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. And I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities. And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. Well, of course, his vengeance does not discriminate. Eventually, it will reach all evildoers. Now, let me pause for a moment and say, of course, we've spoken about irreverence toward God as one of the principal sins of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Naturally, this is closely connected with ill treatment of human beings. We respect human beings because they are made in the image of God. Now, admittedly, we have mangled that image in the fall of our first parents and by our own individual and collective sins. Some glimmer of that image remains, however, so that one cannot revere God as one ought if one does not love other human beings and put that love into practice. Likewise, because whatever dignity human beings possess, they owe to God alone. 
One cannot love other human beings as one ought if one does not sincerely love God and put that love into practice. All right, so enough. So we talked about the first major sin of the two kingdoms, irreverence toward God. This is intimately connected with the second principal sin, namely ill treatment of each other as human beings within both of the kingdoms. Anyway, committed all manner of crimes. And I'm, I'm speaking of crimes in God's eyes. Anyway, not merely those the civil law would penalize. The second sin, the old treatment of each other. So we read in Micah chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And I said, Hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seer shall be disgraced, and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. And so Micah is especially harsh and with those who, when they commit all manner of wickedness in their lives, yet consider themselves secure because of what they call themselves, or of their going through the motions of worshiping the true God. Now, so much for the gloomy side of Micah. Well, there's richly deserved divine judgment, which we need to escape. But of course, there's another side to the message of the Bible as a whole and another side to Micah. Right? Our second main theme in Micah, besides the judgment of the kingdoms, is the reconstruction of God's kingdom on a different basis. Right? And it's reconstructed on a different basis and that it changes in two ways. First, we have a new people 
right? We read Micah predicts in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, the conversion of the Gentiles, right? The breaking down of the middle wall of partition that separated God's people from us, the rest of us, who can claim no physical Jewish heritage. And we read Micah predicting this in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. He says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, of course, as it did in the first century with the beginning of the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. And of course, much of that prophecy, so we know that the fulfillment is still to come. You know, manifestly, we're still in the time of wars and rumors of wars that will come before Christ's second coming. However, thanks be to God, right? God has opened his kingdom to us Gentiles right, and made us together with those who were God's people from the beginning, the Jews, one new man. Yes, so Micah announces the construction of a whole new people of God, including people like us. Second, and even more importantly, we talk about the reconstruction of God's kingdom on a different basis. There will not only be a new people, but, crucially, a new leader. So we read in Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a. But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in, in Israel, Whose, going, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. <coughs> and then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. In other words, Micah is saying that a ruler of ancient lineage, a descendant of David, will be born as David was in Bethlehem. This ruler, of course, is the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. So when Herod asked the chief priest and the scribes where the Messiah would be born, they answered unhesitatingly, Bethlehem, right, appealing to Micah 5, 2, as we just read. And you all know the story from Matthew, in Matthew 2, 1 through 6. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, 
wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And that's something of an under-translation of Ederochthe. He was severely shaken, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ, that is, the Anointed One, the Messiah, was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judah, for so is written by the prophet. Of course, they're referring to Micah, specifically to Micah 5, 2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And of this ruler, this shepherd, Micah in Micah 5, 5 says, He shall be their peace. He, Christ, shall be their peace. For in Christ we attain peace with God, peace which we, being condemned sinners, could never obtain on our own. In Christ, moreover, we attain peace with each other, so that in God's kingdom, as Paul says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female. But you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ alone, finally, we gain that peace which silences our fears. Anything we gain in this world, we can lose in a moment. And we shall lose it when we die. Our salvation in and through Christ, however, no one can take it from, no one can take from us. Even we ourselves cannot take it from us. For as Christ says in John 6:37, "All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me, I will never cast out." We come to Jesus by placing our trust for our salvation, our eternal destiny in Him, whereupon He transforms us in so that we become His faithful disciples. Let us pray.